I had so much fun doing this next interview that even I'm jealous of me. We all know Matt Damon can solve equations, rob casinos, and grow potatoes in his own waste. I am the greatest botanist on this planet. But his latest feat is as master archer William Garin in the Chinese fantasy blockbuster The Great Wall. The Great Wall is the only barrier keeping the world safe. Set a thousand years ago, the film reimagines the Great Wall as humanity's only defence against blood-hungry monsters. Damon's mercenary character has to choose whether to save himself or join the battle to save everyone else. This is big. Like, I, I actually read somewhere that the scale model of the Great Wall that they built was actually scale one to one. <laughs> yes, yes. So does that mean that this is the only movie set that can be seen from the moon? It wasn't quite one to one, so you can see it from, like, the International Space Station. <laughs> yeah. The director, Johnny Mo, he, he, like, among other things, he directed the Beijing uh, Olympic opening ceremony. Well, it felt that big. Like, was it like an opening ceremony every day on set? Yeah, it felt like it felt like doing a movie, uh, like a Hollywood movie, like eighty years ago. You know what I mean? Like it was that <laughs> huge, like like Cecil B. DeMille, biblical right? Exactly. Business. Like yeah. hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of extras, but not just you know. Pre-union is what you're saying. Pre-union. Before everyone got paid properly, <laughs> yes. is that what you're saying? <laughs> yes. Back when we could afford to make movies like that, <laughs> but you know, it's a historical fantasy. It's a big wall to be so nervous. It's this whole army um, called the Nameless Order, and. The, their armor is just so beautiful. Like each one is like a piece of art, and to see like a thousand people in full battle dress and you know moving with like ultimate precision yeah. and like the choreography was like insane. It was and like so, a violent rainbow. It was. It was like a violent rainbow. <laughs> it was. How was the language barrier? Because the, the director didn't speak English. Was that was that difficult? We had about half of the crew was Chinese and half was international. So what that required for a movie that scale was we had a hundred translators on the movie. What? I mean, it was mental. Like when you would go in and just watching everybody get dressed and everybody get, you know, all geared up and just translators flying around, just, you know. But at the same time, we'd all made a lot of movies. We did have one common language. Like, once we started rolling, we all knew what we were doing. So did you trust your translator? Like, would you know if they were giving you shit behind your back? Like, if they were going, I would have Matt no Damon's idea. not worth the money? Yeah, like, would yeah. you know? Never. Never. <laughs> like, I don't like to talk to directors that much anyway, so... Uh, <laughs> no, so we had... So you're uh, just going to work with nothing but Chinese directors yeah, yeah, from, from now on. <laughs> I'm doing every movie with Zhang Yimou from yeah, now on. Easy. So this is the, the point in the interview where normally you'll get asked about working with Ben Affleck. That's kind of compulsory. <laughs> That's fine. Um, I'm pretty sure that you and Ben Affleck are responsible for bringing Afternoon Delight back into the public consciousness. Sky rockets in flight, Afternoon Delight. Because <laughs> it had kind of dropped off the radar and then, and then like you sang it in Good Will Hunting, and then a few years later, it's in Anchorman. I know, they really brought it back. Yeah. They went for it. They did four-part harmony. That's all the way. Woo! Afternoon Delight. Woo! Well, the, the main reason I brought it up is I wanted to thank you uh, because uh, my kid's two now, but about three months in, there was a point like three in the morning, you know when you've got a new baby and you can't get them to sleep? Yes. <laughs> and I was so tired, I couldn't remember the words to like any nursery rhymes, Twinkle Little Star, anything. And so I, it was the only song I could remember. That's fantastic. And I'm there like, <laughs> gonna find my baby, gonna hold him tight. <laughs> and, and there was only halfway through that I'm going, I'm not sure if a song about sex in the afternoon is appropriate <laughs> for this At three moment. in the morning <laughs> for me and my son. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so getting back to Great Wall, it's very early to talk sequels at this stage, but do you think the sequel could actually be on the America-Mexico border wall. And I'm just up there with a bow and arrow shooting people. I mean, yeah. I don't think there'll be money for much else after right. they build it. <laughs> Mexico might build the wall to keep Trump out. <laughs> <laughs> so the new president, he communicates almost entirely on Twitter. But you're not on Twitter. No. Do you think maybe you should get on Twitter to, to communicate with the president? No. Like, let's say I set up a Twitter account. <laughs> like, let's call it, I don't know, um, Matt and Charlie, best friends in the whole wide world. <laughs> Afternoon delight, something like that. <laughs> um, what would you What would you want to tweet at the president if you're going to tweet at him? Here's the thing: he's about to be very busy with the most consequential decisions that beyond anything he could ever have hoped to have to weigh in on. And and I'm afraid if I tweeted at him, he would respond. <laughs> and so I'd rather just give him his time back so that he can focus on what he needs to focus on. Yeah, but it's funny because you're a little bit unique in that. Like a lot of Hollywood like to speak directly 
to the president. Um, is there a reason why you don't like to Meryl Streep the guy so much? No, I mean, I, I look, I, I, I think what Meryl said was, was profound and beautiful, and the reality is when people in power you know, bully people, and uh, you know that it, it really is giving. It's it's excusing that behavior, and kids model their behavior based on their president. And and you know he's got to comport himself in a different way now. He's not he's not a an, a figure in entertainment anymore. He can't say he's going to grab anybody by the pussy anymore. You can't say that. It's it, you know it, you're the president of the United States and. And, and I think everyone needs to give him a chance to be that and, uh, and hope for the best. Hope for the best is it's like the least reassuring... <laughs> it's not quite yes we can, is it? No, it's not. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> now, you touched on something there. Like, you, the president was a former TV star, basically. Yeah. And is now a, is, is now a political leader. So what I thought we'd do, I, I'd test you out with Australian politics and Australian showbiz. If I can show you some people and if you can tell me if you think they're a TV star or a politician. <laughs> Corey Bernardi. I hope he's a TV star. Nah, politician. He's what on TV he, a fair What bit. is he doing? What, what, See, what is I he mean, doing there? Yeah, why is he... Seducing you is what he's doing. his clothes off? Yeah. Bronwyn Bishop. Ah, uh, TV star. No. Conservative politician. Wow. Ah. But she could have been on Days of Our Lives. Look at that. Yeah, no, she's well played, Bronwyn. <laughs> Last one. Tom Gleeson. Uh, he looks so much like he should be a politician that I'm going to say he's a TV star. Yeah, well, not so much stars. Um, second banana. At least he got dressed up for the interview. Well, look who's talking. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, thanks so much for your time. Yeah, Congrats man. on the movie, man. All right, cheers. Cheers.